Okay, move out. crackling sound of small arms fire, the crump of grenades. These are the background sounds you hear in almost every newsreel report on the war in Vietnam. Nearly all headline stories about Vietnam today are reports about battles, counterattacks, ambuscades, and casualty figures. They underline part of the cost of fighting terror and aggression. But there's another aspect of the struggle for freedom in Vietnam, and while it may not lend itself to dramatic headlines, it just possibly may be the most effective technique for providing the Vietnamese people with the opportunity to determine their own destiny. The operation is called Lam Son Two. Now, you may not have heard much about it before, but you'll be hearing more as time goes on. Officially, it's called the Revolutionary Development Program. That's exactly what it is. A revolution. You see, former programs usually meant clearing out the communists and Viet Cong from a village and then moving on. What happened? As soon as the troops were gone, the guerrillas returned, and the reign of terror began again. No wonder the villagers lost faith and hope. Operation Lamson 2 is a different type of operation. A combined United States and Vietnamese army program designed to give the people a real chance to help themselves so they can work, rebuild, and grow strong enough to withstand the attempts of the communists and Viet Cong to re-establish control. Now actually, what you are going to see is how Operation Lamson 2 can transform a a fear-ridden village into a healthy, thriving community. A village, well, uh, a village reborn. From the air and from the ground, this village looks peaceful and tranquil. Truth is, it has long been under communist domination, not by choice, but through terror. Within a matter of hours, although the villagers don't know it yet, the nightmare will come to an end. Every successful operation depends on the way it's planned and executed. Troop dispositions, logistics, and the hundreds of details that must be considered. Here, the final phases of planning the operation are being completed. Responsibilities for this particular operation will be shared by units of the United States Army 1st Division, the Big Red One, Civil Government, and the Arvin, Army of the Republic of Vietnam's 5th Division. Last minute touches are added by the officers who will be commanding the field forces. The tactics are double checked and finalized. The officer in charge of the operation puts it this way. The objective of Lam San Tu is to free from communist control the villages and hamlets now dominated by the Viet Cong. The mission of the U.S. force is to provide a shield behind which the Vietnamese can execute a full program of revolutionary development. The mission is accomplished in four phases. One, we seal and search the village and get rid of the existing Viet Cong organization. 
Two, we secure the operating area through saturation patrolling. Three, we gain the confidence of the people by maintaining their security and allowing the civil government to operate in the area. And four, we develop the bonds between the Hamlet civil government and the government of Vietnam. The operation starts off in the afternoon. United States and Vietnamese troops of the specially trained pacification teams get ready to start out for the distant village. The track vehicles are the first ones to get underway so that all units will arrive at their positions at the same time. As the troops near the village, they will be traveling under cover of darkness. Other units will be airlifted to the site so that the village will be completely surrounded by morning. Still other units have been dispatched to surround the outer perimeter of the village so that in effect, the entire community will be enclosed in a double ring to prevent the escape of any Viet Cong troops or sympathizers. By dawn, the village is completely sealed off from any outside contact. At first light, an airborne public address system begins informing the villagers what to expect. No one is to leave the village. All males between the ages of 15 and 45 are to gather at one area for interrogation and identity check. There will be a festival with entertainment, food and gifts for everyone. There will also be medical and dental clinics available for those who need them. In addition to the broadcast, Leaflets are dropped to make sure that everybody knows what they are to do. Before entering the village, the troops are briefed to treat the people with courtesy and consideration, but to also observe all precautions. Should they come under sniper fire or other hostile action, they are to take appropriate action, swiftly and decisively. The outer ring of troops is also alerted and the roving patrols activated to make certain no Viet Cong can break out of the steel ring. The arrival of the convoy carrying the men, equipment and supplies is the signal for the start of the day's activities, one that will be long remembered in the village. Swinging into action with all the ease and speed of professional roustabouts, the troops begin preparations for the festivities. Following instructions, all males present between 15 and 45 years of age gather at one end of the village. They will be taken to an interrogation center for a check on their identity card and a thorough questioning, after which they will be returned to the village. The other villagers are called to the festival area and told of the services available to them. They are reassured that they have nothing to fear. And from now on, the Viet Cong will no longer be able to threaten them. One of the strongest weapons against the enemy, if medical aid can be called a weapon, is the clinic. Here, people who often do not get to see a doctor from one year to another are treated for the host of diseases that are right in the tropics. No festival would be complete without music, and the 1st Division Band arrives in force. Basically, the reason for the festival and other activities is to keep the villagers occupied so they will not be endangered during the search for the Viet Cong. All children love clowns, and these children who may never have seen one lose no time in following this modern Pied Piper. 
It is also a well-tried method for keeping the little ones out of danger. The medical unit, although handling a tremendous load, does much more than administer first aid and take care of minor medical problems. Many of the patients are given a complete checkup, some for the first time in their lives, and when necessary, are given the required treatment and medication, along with simple directions for taking them. The training of Vietnamese doctors, nurses, and other medical personnel is a slow process. But it is one of the strongest methods of establishing a bond between the villagers and the government. It is perhaps one of the strongest indications that the central government of Vietnam is taking an active and vital interest in the welfare of its people. In a nation where roads are few and the people relatively isolated in their villages, few, if any, of the villagers have ever seen as much entertainment at one time in their lives. While the other villagers are being entertained, the men are being interrogated. Each ID card is examined for forgery, and names and descriptions are carefully checked against lists of known Viet Cong members. Every man is questioned in private, all for the same length of time, and then dismissed with a gift. In this way, no one knows who has supplied information, and no reprisals can be taken. This portion of Operation Lam Son II is one of the most productive sources of intelligence material available today. As each man is cleared, he is returned to the village so that he may enjoy the festival and fair. As another facet of the festival and fair, members of the Vietnamese revolutionary team provide up-to-date agricultural information on ways for the villagers to improve animal husbandry and increase the yield of their fish pot, a most important source of desperately needed protein for their diet. While the villagers are being entertained in the festival area, the grim business of the search is going on. Specially trained teams of American and Vietnamese troops with their dogs go through every house, hut, and shed. In some cases, isolated villagers who have been subjected to the terrorist tactics of the Viet Cong try to hide from the search parties. When found, they are interrogated and checked out. If they pass the careful scrutiny, they are assured that no harm will come to them and are directed to join the other villagers in the festival area. It will take time for this family to realize the Viet Cong nightmare is drawing to a close. When tunnels are discovered, they are filled with smoke and then inspected for arms, ammunition, and food caches. The Arvin troops also furnish a good deal of the talent for the festival. And while this particular group may never make the top 40, the villagers seem to eat it up. And uh, speaking of eating, there's good food and plenty of it. Plates heaped high with fish and rice meat and vegetables, ice cream, a rare treat, all you can eat, and then some. Everyone from bent village elder to toddlers, all are fed as never before in their lives. Along with the fun and food, there are also gifts for youngsters of school age, pencils, copy books, other scarce and welcome school supplies. For the little ones, there are toys, candy, and other rare and welcome gifts.
For the adult, the gifts are of a more practical nature. Food, sewing supplies, and other rare and cherished presents. No one is left out. The house-to-house -house search continues. A tricky and dangerous business. This Arvin soldier was hit by a Viet Cong sniper, who was himself killed immediately afterwards. From dawn to day's end, the outer patrols scour the countryside. Operation Lam San is feared by the Viet Cong because it eliminates the element of terror from their arsenal. People who are not frightened will resist aggression vigorously. Throughout the afternoon, the fun, feasting, and entertainment continues lightening the load, if only for a while, of a village that has lived too long in the shadow of fear. As the entertainment draws to a close, an Arvin officer, actually the province chief, tells the villagers what they may expect. True, the show will end, the festival will be over, but the village will not be left helpless or to fend for itself. Soldiers of the Arvin 5th Division and young men trained as members of the Revolutionary Development Team will remain to help them defend the village against the return of the Viet Cong. As the day draws to a close, the final gifts of food are distributed. The stages and tents are struck and stowed aboard the truck. In a way, it's just like watching a country fair after the last show, but there is a difference. For this village, the real activity is only beginning. Under the direction and with the help of the members of the Vietnamese Army and the members of the Revolutionary Development Team, barbed wire is strung, foxholes are dug, and the perimeter of the village is made secure. In the days to come, the real strength of Operation Lam Sun begins to show. Headed by civic action teams of both the 1st Division and the Arvin 5th, a whole series of carefully planned improvements and village developments are put into action. Wells are often the only supply of water, and they are often contaminated. New wells are dug under the watchful eye of an army engineer. Deep, well constructed, so that the village will enjoy a plentiful supply of clean, pure water that won't become contaminated or collapse during the fierce rains of the monsoon season. One of the most serious problems the Civic Action and Revolutionary Development teams have to contend with is the education of the people regarding sanitation This cesspool was the first of such rudimentary sewage disposal improvements the villagers had ever seen. And they had to be convinced it was necessary for their health and that of their children. Once they understood that it would eliminate much of the sickness and disease caused by contamination, they fell to with a will. Old bridges are repaired and new ones built under the direction of trained personnel. The men of the village work quickly and for long hours. The only help they require are tools and the chance to do something for themselves. Like the old-time pioneer doctor of horse and buggy days, this jeep-driving medic provides medical attention for the men, women, and children of the village. His rounds provide a high point in the life of the people who for too long have been denied adequate medical care under the callous tyranny of the Viet Cong. Whenever possible, if the case is serious enough, the medic will try to have the patient removed to a hospital for more intensive treatment. Because of Viet Cong terrorism, some of the fields have not been worked for some time. So it is necessary to use heavy machinery to re-clear the land so that it may once more produce food. 
One little known but very important part of Lam San's civic action program is the veterinarian section, which sends teams around to the villages, teaching the latest methods of animal husbandry, inspecting and inoculating the livestock against disease, and making sure the animals are in good shape. In a country where the general diet is so unbalanced, sometimes they are the only source of protein these people have. In many cases, nearby army camps distribute their garbage as swill for the pigs. In the event that for one reason or another the crop failed, or because the retreating Viet Cong have confiscated the village's food supply, it often becomes necessary for rice to be brought in from other areas. Here, another facet of Operation Lam San Tu becomes evident. Once the food has been airlifted to the village, it is turned over to the local authorities for distribution, reinforcing the fact that the local government is being backed to the fullest by the central government. In addition to helping rebuild the village, the civic action groups also set up educational programs. In the usual run of events, few of these children would ever have a chance for education. But by furnishing equipment and school supplies, and with the help of servicemen who donate their free time to teach, this generation of Vietnamese will be better equipped to take an active part in running their country. Almost every one of us can remember the school playground with its slides, swings, and other equipment. But here, where the children have few places to play and have almost forgotten how to laugh and run, the construction of a merry-go-round becomes a major event. These soldiers bought the material and donated their off-duty time from patrols because, well, because kids need to play and laugh and have fun. Although the village area is supposed to be cleared of Viet Cong influence, the only way in which it can remain free is if it is strong enough to defend itself. Both the Arvin troops stationed in the area and the revolutionary development team see to it that the defenses of the village are properly set up and manned. In addition to instructing the men in the village in the use of weapons and tactics, these instructors also take their turn at guard mountain sentry duty. When the village is secure, the fields work properly, and with good weather, the rice crop ripens and is harvested. After threshing, it is spread out to dry and then winnowed in the age-old manner. This is the way it has always been done and quite probably how it will continue to be done until the farmers can afford modern machinery and adopt modern methods. One of the most significant indications that the village is resuming a freer, more normal existence is the activity in the marketplace. Here you won't find the crowded, milling, shopping sections of the larger towns but the stalls and small groups of farmers' wives and local merchants conducting their business in peace and tranquility. Underlining the fact that Operation Lam San Tu is in truth a long-range program are such projects as the Little Red Schoolhouse program. By supplying the villagers with tools and materials, as well as expert technical advice, the people can not only build desperately needed schools, but also get the feeling that they are taking on a larger share of the responsibility that comes with self-government. Yet another innovation of importance to village life is the introduction of a free milk program for school children. Here at home, it may not sound like a great accomplishment, but in a land where only the wealthy can provide such a luxury for their own, the idea becomes a matter of great importance to the parents of these youngsters. With 
with children, it doesn't take too long for them to adjust to the idea that life can be very pleasant when you have enough to eat, are clean and healthy, and you can laugh, run and play just as much as you want to. And tomorrow will be just like today, no hiding and no crying, unless you bump your knee. Another big indication that the plan is working in this village and working well is in the way the villagers look and act at home. Granted, they may be camera shy and hesitant to relax, but they are not frightened. There's no denying they are at peace, able to carry out their daily activities and sleep soundly at night. In Vietnam today, that's saying quite a lot. The important place on Operation Lam San Tu was recently demonstrated by a visit of inspection by the then ambassador, Henry Cabot Lodge. In addition to eyewitnessing the carnival atmosphere and the enthusiasm of the villagers for the festival, food, entertainment, and the medical aid program, the ambassador was thoroughly briefed on the more important aspects of the operation. Intelligence officers pointed out the wealth of information gathered about the local Viet Cong organization and how it helped to disrupt their activities. Team commanders reported on the tremendous improvement in village morale, how the idea was taking hold of people's imagination. Now they could resist aggression. The ambassador left, but for the Lam San team, the work in the village had barely begun. Right now, we don't know if Operation Lam Sun II is an answer to most of our problems in Vietnam. Only time will tell us that. This we do know. The idea does work. It is working now in villages throughout Vietnam. It may well be that we will extend this type of joint United States-Vietnamese operation into every province, hamlet, and village. But keep one basic fact in mind. The rebirth of these villages is not a handout program. We are only helping a beleaguered people to help themselves. 